Okay. Should we do this yep. every coin Let's... cloud? Should I hold it and then I can I'll do it. I'll hold it. Come on in, please. Great. Thank you, folks. Come on in. There's some little First cupcakes. Come for sale. Oh, okay. Yes, cupcakes. Give people a few minutes to trickle. Can someone online just let me know if you can hear us with the thumbs up? Now I have to be able to see the. You have to be close. <laughs> you can hold that there. Yeah. Is it good? You have to press anything or you're just, just ready to go? Ready to go. <laughs> I need to, I really need some water. I may, I may have to step out and get water at one point. Yeah. 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 I'm going to just check outside for a second, see if anyone's coming down the hallway. And then we're gonna, I'm doing one check in the hallway, then we're going to get going. All righty, folks. Welcome. Remember when we used to get together in person for talks? This actually looks really, really good. So um, welcome to the 2024 Alice B. Kroger talk, distinguished talk. Uh, I'm Jane Greenberg. I think I know a lot of you, but not all of you. Come on in. Help yourself to a cupcake if you would like. The metadata about what's in the cupcakes is on their wrappers. So, all right, let me continue. I'm Jane Greenberg, and I direct a, a small group called the Metadata Research Center. Uh, it's really a small C, and we integrate with the data science folks and the AI folks and the information science folks. And our group in particular kind of geeks out about metadata. We love standards, we love metadata schemes, we love ontologies and those kinds of things. I am the Alice B. Kroger professor, and every year I do try to have 
a distinguished guest come in. I've always drawn from outside the university, but this year it was just very obvious to invite Josh Agar. Agar, Agar, I just keep messing up his name even though I'm working with him. All right, I do need to tell you a little bit about Alice B. Kroger. She was an American librarian and educator. She was a student of Melville Dewey's. Anybody ever hear of the Dewey Decimal System? Yeah. So Melville Dewey actually got kicked out of Columbia University. He started library school. He had some problems with the ladies, but he also got kicked out because he allowed women to get degrees. They didn't like it. He went up to Albany and he started the library school up in Albany. And then New York City was, was like freaking out because they needed more librarians and Columbia University invited him back. But when he was up in Albany, Alice B. Kroger was one of his students and she was a top student. So when the Institute, Drexel Institute of Art, Science and Industry was founded, he was consulted and asked to recommend somebody to start up a school of library science and he recommended Alice Kroger. Drexel University itself was the fourth library science program to open in the United States. And Alice Kroger was an advocate of education, of advancing knowledge, knowledge discovery for all, and of innovation. So I, I really truly feel honored to be associated with her in some way. Uh, she directed the library school throughout her life until her death in 1909. So let me tell you about our distinguished guests. Uh, there's a nice bio note on the webpage. Jo uh, Joshua Agar is an assistant professor in the Department of Mechanical Engineering and Mechanics at Drexel University. He has a foundational background in experimental materials science. He's predominantly renowned for his pioneering contributions to AI algorithms, computing infrastructure, development of cyber physical systems in the field of material synthesis, synthesis and microscopy. Josh has many other things that he can share about himself. And so please do full, feel free to share any other highlights. But I would like to just share one more thing that he is PI of a new MRI and NSF MRI infrastructure grant that is um, really nearly $4 million that he just brought into the university. And this is really helpful for infrastructure and compute resources. And some of us here are actually working with him pretty closely uh, Chad, myself, or any of our other students, Scott back there. And it's it's really, Josh, a delight to have you come here and trudge on up in, and all of you in this not great weather come to hear you speak. And we have a lot of people online. I will monitor the chat box for people who will have questions and others. And we, I will give you a warning at some point so we can have some questions. So take it away. Thank you, Josh. So, Jane, thank you for the nice introduction and um, the, the opportunity to speak here. It's really nice to be in the College of Computing. Uh, this is only my second time that I've been over here and I've been at Drexel for about two years, um, almost two years. So I have probably too many slides, so good to get started. So I call the, the talk Navigating the Data Deluge, AI Infrastructure and Decision Making in the Era of Big Data kind of very generic title because we cover a lot of different things and a lot of interesting areas that at least what I think is interesting. Um, so I'd like to start with kind of my research philosophy and where I came because it kind of, it kind of shapes how I approach science. So I started out doing synthesis of complex oxides. Uh, this probably means almost nothing to the audience here. It's like making materials with a laser, uh, ablating a target and growing very thin layers, sub subunit cell layers of material on a, a substrate to try to engineer the materials to have unique functionality. Uh, this is like a black magic. You can think it's really difficult uh, and very frustrating because there's almost no reproducibility. Um, with like trying to build these materials, we really cared about understanding the, the material structure. And we, so to do that, we rely on a lot of multi-dimensional spectroscopy, a lot in the scan probe space. So where you take a little tip and touch the surface and it's like your little finger on the surface. Uh, that allows you to measure properties of, the, of a material. Uh, but that creates a lot of data and a lot of high dimensional data. So the natural thing was we have so much data, we have no idea what to do with it. So we really started building some tools and, and relying on machine learning. I was at Berkeley kind of in, the, in 2017, 2018, when AI was just starting to pick up and there were a lot of new capabilities. And that really allowed me to kind of analyze data in new ways and adapt machine learning. And then 
more recently, within the past four years, I worked with a really nice team kind of deploying uh, machine learning models on different compute hardware architectures to hit our practical limitations that we have. Um, and this kind of covers the, the, the scope of our work, but then there's a lot of, of work kind of more related to the metadata and data preservation side, where we where if you're gonna build these systems that, that really have some utilization and you need to be able to preserve and save your data and you need to have both the infrastructure, both on the software and hardware side to do that. Um, so this is kind of the overview of, of where I, so I like to think about the practical problems in science and engineering. So we have machine learning science, so we have, how do you save and preserve and search data? So we have way too much data that we're generating in, in labs. And this, the amount of data is getting pushed from the big user facilities, like uh, the accelerators down to the little, like local labs here at Drexel. And the question is, how do you deal with that data? So most, what ends up happening is most data goes underanalyzed or gets kind of put in data lakes that never get seen. Uh, then there's a problem of how do you make data fair? So I had fun playing around with Dolly trying to do it. And I think this brings up a really good point. So we can all understand what that means, that, that, that that's the words for fair, but it can't spell correctly. Uh, no matter how much I try to say spell things correctly, it cannot make an image that spells correctly. Um, and this kind of brings up a point that like AI needs to be considered carefully, um, but it looks kind of nice anyway. But the problem is that science is distributed and, and it's very rare that data that is actually collected is, is preserved and managed in a centralized location and is shareable with anyone else. Most data that, that's collected in the local labs just sits on the local file system, maybe gets moved by USB or gets sent uh, via some uh, put, put on OneDrive or some other system. And that's really not sufficient because it's disaggregated from the metadata. It's not searchable. Um, it's, and it's really challenging for anyone other than the original data creator to use. Uh, we need for science high availability HPC resources. Right now, most HPC facilities are managed by Slurm. So you need to schedule. The resources aren't available. You don't have access to it when you need it. We're doing experiments. We need to make decisions based on the analysis that happens in human timescales, but also in timescales that are that are relevant to experiments. So sometimes that could be, that varies. It really depends on the experiment. So it could be on the order of uh, tens of milliseconds. It could be microseconds. It could be seconds. These have very different compute requirements and we need to consider how we do that. Another problem is network infrastructure. So sometimes you have, um, you have uh, a lot of data. And if you're thinking about on our campus, for instance, in most campuses, you have one gigabit e ethernet for it's at the end. Uh, so if you have one terabyte generated, it's gonna take about 2.5 hours to move that data. So if you need to get, get some feedback, that's not viable. Uh, so you need to think no, about edge resources and how to change the infrastructure. <laughs> so I'll just kind of start with one kind of thing that we've started doing is, is, is developing cyber infrastructure for for our systems that we have. So we have a lab where we grow materials, we collect metadata that's associated with that, how those materials are created, what the properties of the system are. We do microscopy. These two systems are completely disaggregated. So being able to connect that information together is really important. And the system that we've kind of worked on and used is a system called DataFed. Uh, so what DataFed does is it, it's a uh, database built on a Rango DB with a front end web interface that uses trusted authentication with Globus to allow um, you to build Python APIs and other and command line interfaces to, to send data via Globus directly from instruments, preserve the metadata in a graph relational database, and also preserve the files and allow sharing. This is something that really doesn't exist outside, like anywhere else um, in terms of, and this is built out of Oak Ridge National Lab is the primary interface. So we're gonna be spinning uh, this, this system up at, at Drexel. Um, then once you have data, you can start doing things with that data. So you can start building search tools, like a new uh, schema-free search tools. We'll talk some about that. And then also doing some things with actually doing machine learning-based analysis to do searching of data, uh, for example, like image similarity. So this is kind of just a kind of demonstration of the front interface. So this is what, what DataFed looks like. It's federated in that you can have many different data repositories. Um, so anyone can spin up their own data repository and the metadata is managed centrally. It allows for hierarchical metadata, unstructured metadata, allows you to predefine schemas if you want. Um, you can do any sort of logical query that you would like. It's built on a RangoDB, uh, which is a graph relational database. There's a, and 
It allows for very fine-grained administrative control over who has access to data records, and all the data records can be shared uh, very, very easily using Globus uh, with Grid FTP. And uh, so it's a really powerful tool that allows just management of data. This is the first most important step. Um, then there's a problem of user compliance. How do you get people to actually use it? If, if, if for scientists, if it takes one extra step, they're not going to do it. Um, this is the general philosophy. Like it, it has to be easier and it has to be trans, like they have to not see it. Uh, so like things that we've done is just for like our growth facility. These are, here we have our basic information. A lot, we have a front end user interface that takes data from the sensors that are, that are on the system itself. And then it's merging from multiple different data sources as well and compiling that. And when you click that save and upload button, it saves, it sends multiple data records and has the linkages between all those data records. It even has information in, in this pipeline built in for like the maintenance logs of the system. So you can track when a maintenance log happened and when a change happened so that we can go back in time and validate that certain experiments were conducted under these conditions to say like this does not, most of the time it's written in lab notebooks and those lab notebooks leave with the PhD student and they're written in the PhD student's handwriting and schema. And you would never know where to find record number X in a lab notebook for uh, because that doesn't really exist. And then, the, so everything gets disaggregated. So when you start collecting lots of data, having this, this data management system really matters. Uh, then kind of been working in a, we have a grant with uh, Jeff Heflin at Lehigh, where we're working on building uh, some new type of search tools that allow you to, to deal with data that doesn't have a schema. It allows you to do the cell centric searching, allows you to really just kind of do, create sets of histograms based on commonalities, and then do recursive searching through that database. Uh, this is really nice for metadata. The problem is that we have a lot of data that also needs to be searched, like images. So um, like one thing we do, these look like pretty pretty images. This is the atomic force microscopy. So this is looking at the surface that, for kind of reference that scale bar is 500 nanometers. Um, you can get down to atomic resolution, but we get thousands of images that look like this. And we wanna draw correlations and comparisons and make similarity. And how do you find that? How do you search images when it's unstructured? That's kind of hard. So the, the like most common approach, and this is a very simple VGG 16, it doesn't really matter what the architecture is, is you can take some neural network that analyzes the images, it builds out some features, that feature gets stored in some vector, and then that vector has some information about the similarity. If the vectors are close, they should be somewhat similar. If they're far apart, they, they should be more dissimilar. Uh, so if you do this, this is just an example from CIFAR 10. You can see that kind of people get grouped here. If you do a projection, this is uh, T stochastic nearest neighbor embeddings. Um, here you you have all sorts of different groupings that make sense. That make kind of make sense. It was just trained on on this data. So, but what's more interesting is that you have areas over here where you have like chickens and uh, cows, which are different classes, but they're grouped together because they're all animals. So there's similarities in the images. Uh, that's pretty pretty useful, allows you to kind of explore images without having to give it any, any predetermined information. So we, we here we took a database of uh, 25,000 images that we had from our microscope, which is a reasonably small data set, still large enough, and it doesn't work well when you start to do the projections. And why is that? Because we took a data set that, or a neural network that was trained on cats and dogs and tried to apply it to microscope images. It just doesn't work well. Uh, so you then have to think about like, what is the physics underneath? Where, where is the information content contained within the data? And in this case, uh, we care in materials mostly about order, periodicity, and symmetry. Um, so th that can be defined by what's known as the wallpaper group. So these are the periodic arrangements. It's like, there's a lot of basis in crystallography, but also in Kind of, uh, kind of applied mathematics. And we said, okay, can we train a model that can learn symmetry? Uh, can, we, can we just generate data and learn symmetry? Uh, so here's kind of the 17 classes of wallpaper group symmetry. Um, we, we go and we train a model. We get almost perfect results on the, this is the training. Um, so that's, that looks nice. We'll, we'll, we'll uh, hold that thought for a while and then we'll come back to it later. Uh, but once we do train this model, that's an approximative symmetry, we'll say learning symmetry, it's not really actually learning symmetry. We go and 
uh, we can create the projections and the projections are much better. So you can start to see like, okay, this region of, uh, over here, this is all what's known as uh, CA domain structure in this lead zirconium titanate. We, we didn't give it any metadata to help find it. It just found it by, by analyzing the symmetry in the images. Um, here's, a, here's another example. This is all what's known as stripe phase BFO. This is very, that's a multi ferroic material. Um, another area that was, was interesting, this area over here, it's all uh, mixed domain structure. So where you have domain structure competition between different phases. Um, we had just data that had person name and then number, sample number. And that's all we had in terms of, of like information in the files about the, that information. So being able to go back through time and, and make these correlations is really, really valuable from an image standpoint. Uh, so we took it a step further. I had a really good undergraduate student who built this little app and we're actually building a better version of this where you can go in and you can say, okay, here's a projection. Let me take a region of interest and then go do recursive searching. So create a new projection. And now that new projection has a, a narrowly defined topology and you can go zoom in and you can see like this area was an area that we patterned. We had no idea that that was like, that we had no idea how to find these samples in the database. You can see it's labeled as just numbers. That's still all we had in terms of the file name. But now we know that there was a set of experiments there. And you can see there's a lot of similarity as you move around the structure. So you're able to discover records that are similar to one another, uh, then tie it in with metadata. So that combination of what, what we're building is kind of the software infrastructure to combine that cell-centric search tool with this uh, image similarity search tool to really enable you to search images in a recursive and, and meaningful way. So I'm gonna go back to this concept of, of symmetry and so can, can a neural network learn symmetry? And we have some interesting results that rec recently, um, but what's kind of interesting, so we created this data set and the data set is we took little swatches of ImageNet uh, that matched the uh, unit cell and created wallpaper group symmetries with varying different uh, different parameters about how the symmetry was arranged. Uh, if we go and you train train a model and you do the normal thing of validating, and this is validating on 40,000 images per class, so it's pretty large, um, you go and you, and you get results that are nearly perfect. Um, they're almost perfect. I think there's a typo there. I think it's like 98 something. So, so I'm sorry for that. Um, but what we thought, okay, if it learns symmetry, it should be like a foundation model. It should be able to apply beyond just that first data set type that we generated. It should apply to other data set types that have the same symmetry operators. Uh, so you say, okay, can I make a data set that looks like atoms? Can you make a data set that's just built with noise? And how does the model perform? Uh, so if we go and we cross validate on a different data set, so out of domain cross validation, you get about 50% accuracy. So your model's not so good. That means it's not learning symmetry. That kind of makes sense with how convolutions work. Uh, as you convolve something, you're including translational invariance. You have no way to include mirror and glide symmetry it, uh, in a parsimonious way into a model. Um, so this is kind of an, an interesting thought. So we tried a bunch of different models, like using the kind of bigger, larger models, like uh, large scale transformer models, uh, and you still couldn't get good results. Then the, the first thing that material scientists at least think about is like, okay, can you do a, some sort of transformation that makes sense? So can you do a fast Fourier transform, turn the information into periodic information? Or can you do a radon transform and get the angular information from the image? And that will that help you solve the problem? Uh, the answer is actually, it's much worse. <laughs> uh, and the reason is because like if you think of it for like the FFT, you have a convolution, it's compressing information spatially. So it's losing spatial precision, which is actually what you care about. Um, so your model does, does much, much worse. Radon is about the same, uh, probably because it doesn't have as much of the spatial components, more angular component and patterns. So then we said, okay, does size matter? Uh, and the answer is yes, it really does. So we went up to 10 million images and if you start to do the cross validation, you can see you get almost 95% result. This came out just a little bit. We, we really had to scale up our early. So this is 10 million images that tra trained on. So it's a pretty large data set. I think the data set size is something like um, 12 terabytes of, of raw data. We have it stored here locally in Drexel, yeah, yeah in our, our compute clusters. Um, but we still can't get the atom 
data set to work. So we're trying to figure out that it's an open question. We've tried to embed symmetry operators inside the neural network, uh, and we're still trying to figure out how to how to tailor the neural network so that it can better understand order periodicity and symmetry. Uh, but it's an interesting use case because most researchers would stop at saying, okay, I train this data set, and then I validate it on this, and it looks like I have 99% accuracy or 98% accuracy. That's where they stop. That's a validation step. So it's really thinking about how can you uh, test the balance of where your neural network performs on the objective that you have. Um, so now I like to think about like kind of more the practical side of, uh, or other practical aspects of machine learning for science. So uh, in, in scientific applications, we really want applications where we have parsimony, where we can learn something that we can physically interpret. The neural networks are classically known for having completely uninterpretable results. So here you have this circle, and I like to think, okay, you put some triangle there. This is how neural networks normally work. If you take a bunch of triangles, eventually you get a circle. That is not a useful way to solve a problem uh, because what happens if you have a different size circle? Now nothing works. That triangle is completely, is a really poor representation of that circle. Um, so it just doesn't work. So what you really wanna do is you wanna embed physics and concepts of physics, like governing equations into the neural network to really help you solve problems in a way that's more interpretable. Uh, so we want to constrain the model to either learn or, or be have a hard constraint, soft constraint, or, or a way to sparsely learn the governing equations. And then the other problem we have for science is we have time constraints for our scientific applications. Like we have event horizons that are mission critical. Uh, so it might be seconds if you're trying to direct a scientific experiment while on the instrument. That's like enough for a user to not be bothered by the, the time it takes to make a decision. Uh, it might be you want fast enough for closed loop control of physical systems on the order of seconds to milliseconds. And that could be fast enough for like on the fly processing. So kind of milliseconds to nanoseconds. And it, depending on where you are, you have to choose your hardware platform and, your, and it imposes different design constraints on your model. Uh, so it really requires co-design of the computing hardware, the, the physical system and the model. Uh, and this, is, this has a lot of interesting constraints on your model design. Uh, so we'll start with talking about one technique that we do a lot. It's called this band excitation piezo response force microscopy. Don't really need to know what it is. Uh, all that is kind of important is that you're, you're driving a material to switch between multiple states and you're measuring its dynamic response at each step along this with this band excitation waveform that's actually measuring the full cantilever resonance behavior. So every single one of these steps is a curve like this. Um, and then it, you do that at every single point. So you can imagine this data set is rather high dimensional, it's large, it's complex. Um, the common thing that we have to do in this measurement to even extract basic information is we have this raw signal, you do a fast Fourier transform, you get the resonance response, and you wanna fit this resonance response to an underlying governing equation. In this case, it's a simple harmonic oscillator model. So it's a very simple equation. There's only four unknown parameters, you just have to fit it. Uh, but your data is noisy. Um, as you can see, there's all this noise, particularly in the phase. Um, it depends on your, your, um, your cantilever response and your material response. So the question comes like, can you use a neural network to accelerate this? Uh, so what we, we did is we developed this neural network and this actually particularly designed to be tiny. So it's only like 4,096 parameters, I think. Um, an important part is this message passing layer that, that takes early information that looks at kind of large regions of the of the spectra and then um, that and passes that to the later end where we try to predict these parameters but here what we're doing is this last dense layer is just predicting these four parameters the amplitude the resonance frequency the quality factor and the phase uh, so it's it's hard physics constrained but that's a differentiable equation so we can train that end to end so this is like our underlying governing equation is our decoder uh, we extract what the dense layer produces we get the parameterization and we can actually analyze it. So we start with this uh, real and imaginary component. We do the results, we kind of compare. Um, so this is what it looks like. It looks pretty much exactly what we would expect compared to the least squared fitting results. Um, there you start to notice some weird things like these tails in the least squared fits. Those are actually bad fits. We went in and analyzed that. Um, it's because if you have a bad initial guess, you have to pre-design the initial guess. It can get stuck in a local minimum doesn't fit that well. The neural network's much more robust because we added that message passing layer that looks at like the, the large scale information and then also the, the small scale information for the optimization. 
So, but if we look at like kind of the natural results that we get, you gotta see this video, this is kind of like watching the switching process it looks more or less the same. You don't see any difference. That's not, that's kind of good. It's what we would expect. It's not that exciting because we could do it both ways. The nice thing about the neural network is it can fit the data in about uh, two minutes in training where the least squared fitting, I mean, depends on how many compute resources you have, but on a similar cost compute resource, it would take about 30 minutes to fit. So, but things get a lot more interesting when we start to just artificially add noise. So if we add noise to the, to the signal, what, what happens is these tails become much bigger because the initial guesses get bad. Uh, and eventually you get to the point where you're essentially completely unable to fit the data with the, um, when you use a, a conventional algorithm because it doesn't know how to guess and get stuck in a local minimum. But the neural network is still fairly robust. This allows you to kind of reduce your amount of signal to noise, which means you're reducing your damage to your material, you're reducing the energy, the, the, the averaging time, all these things matter. And the real reason why this happens is because you're doing stochastic averaging. So when you train a neural network, you take random batches, you optimize as an ensemble, and then you take new random batches. That's a, a nice way of doing averaging without the problem of, of having, um, uh, without having any sort of problems with like overfitting to a specific data set and being too noisy. So this is kind of the example of this really noisy examples. You can see, you can't see anything in the raw response. There's nothing, that, no, no information left, but you can still see some of the underlying information in the, when you train with a neural network. These are uh, trained with two different optimizers. Uh, the bottom one is a trust region, second order optimizer that does a quick approximate of the Hessian. Uh, that's kind of a, a, a little uh, kind of side note. If you use better optimizers, particularly on small networks, you can get much better uh, fit results. So then the next question is like, okay, we wanna make this fast. That, each of those um, individual curves uh, take about four milliseconds to acquire. And a lot of, like one thing that we really wanna do is we wanna be able to write materials and control their, how they switch and behave. So that means we need to analyze the, those curves in four milliseconds. That is pretty much impossible on any compute resource to get the data to the, to the compute resource, have it be deterministic in terms of latency and give a result and feedback for control. Uh, so I started working a lot with people at Fermilab, particularly non-trend, and a bunch of other people in this fast machine learning community. And they've kind of been working for a while on this problem where they have, the, they work on the Large Hadron Collider, and they need to compress data at, that comes off in 40, pe or in, on the order of petabytes per second. And they need to make a decision if the data is worth saving at, the, at 40 megahertz. This is absolutely insane. If you want to think about what this is, it's 10 times the average traffic in the North America in terms of internet. And they, because physically to, to save it, the good thing is that most of the events are not important. Uh, but th the only way to do this is to have different levels of data reduction or data compression, starting on ASICs and FPGAs that are, that are tailor made for the specific late, uh, latency and requirements that you have. Um, so we kind of thought, okay, can we do the same sort of thing? Uh, it's a much easier scale actually in this case, because we have, but we're doing it on a bench top. Uh, so here we have our, our data stream goes into a, uh, an oscilloscope that measures it. We have a very tiny uh, model that's deployed on an FPGA inside a national instruments card, and we can get the fit results. And when we, we, how we how we do this and streamline this process is a, is a kind of package that is built called uh, HLS for ML, primarily uh, built kind of at a Fermi lab again with a lot of collaborators who are all doing interesting things. It's a really nice community if you're interested uh, in getting involved. But the concept is that you can take models trained in TensorFlow or Keras, do some model compression. You try to do like uh, pruning or quantization of the model to reduce the, um, or reduce the computational complexity. And then this HLS for ML package allows you to do the conversion into high level synthesis. You can do some fine tuning, and then you can deploy that model on an, you can compile it and deploy it on an FPGA. Uh, this takes the design cycle that was probably on the order of a few years down to a month or two. Still not good, we're trying to make it faster. Um, so 
when you do this for this application, uh, we can get latencies that are just insanely fast. So kind of almost completely irrelevant. So you're kind of on the order of 12 microseconds for, for your model. Uh, that's, it was just easy to get that fast. So just what happened. Uh, actually, what, what's interesting is that the FFT that's required take a majority of the time. So the, there's about 329 microseconds just for doing the FFT. And then the neural network on inference is only like, can be depending on our model that we choose, uh, we chose a slightly larger model because then we get better performance in terms, and the, the latency doesn't matter, but we're hitting our latency targets that we're able to analyze within the four, four millisecond timescale and can use that for decision and control. So now I wanna talk about another kind of interesting application where we're, we're doing something uh, similar and modifying neural networks in interesting ways. Uh, so there's this experiment that is also very data intensive. So it's uh, called scanning transmission electron micro microscopy. So here you have an electron beam and it's interacting with um, a electron transparent material. And what it does is it, that creates a diffraction pattern and that diffraction pattern is what you analyze. So it, this detector can operate on the order of this pixelated detector, like 256 by 256 pixels at 10 kilohertz. Um, so pretty fast. And what, what you're trying to do here is you're trying to, to determine what the scale, the shear on that crystal structure is, the rotation of that, uh, of that crystal structure, and also what the underlying crystal structure is. Um, that's the underlying objective. And the question is, can you do that in a meaningful way with a neural network? Uh, so we designed this kind of unique uh, autoencoder that we call cycle consistent spatial transforming autoencoder because you don't have labels. There's no way to make a good label. Uh, what? Well, there's no metadata. There's no label because it's an experiment. But we do have the metadata associated with it as well. So here you have your in input set of diffraction images that you have, and we start out with building an encoder. And this encoder doesn't really matter, but the first part is this kind of uh, a way to do sparse classification in an unsupervised way. We're saying predict which, which one is the most and give it a, a create a one hot encoded vector. So a vector that's one or zero, one with a bunch of zeros and to any number of classes that we predefine. And then we say, let's overfit that and just decode to give, a, give us a dictionary. That gives us a dictionary. So this is like a, the crystal structure that we have. Then we say, okay, we're gonna upsample this image and we're gonna try to predict the theta matrix of an affine transformation apply that affine transformation to the input image. And if those match, then we've learned the transformation, the geometric transformation, and we've learned the crystal structure. Um, there's some other tricks because if you, okay, you are applying a fine transformation, now you change the spot shape. So we have another little uh, neural network that works over here that goes and says, okay, let me find the position of each spot and let me do the inverse transform on each spot. So the spot's shape doesn't change because we care about sub-pixel precision in this application. Um, and then we train this cycle consistently because it helps with the optimization. Um, actually, this loss is much more important. So you say, okay, it's gonna take this learned dictionary and I'm gonna apply the inverse affine transformation and compare it back to the original image. So there are no labels provided. It's, it's an autoencoder. Um, and it's a, and what you can, where your information is extracted is the theta matrix, which has the, the tensor for the strain and um, the which class it belongs to. So uh, we were very lucky to work with Colin Ophis at uh, NSEM at Berkeley. That's the National Center for Electron Microscopy. And he uh, is probably the only person in the world who can simulate a data set of this type where, uh, so this is a simulated data set because we needed a ground truth where we have different grains, so different uh, grains of material, they have different orientation and they have strain values between negative two and 2% at the integer values. Um, this is actually really large strain for materials. 2% strain is like really, really big for a crystal to go. Usually it's on a much smaller. So it's actually a harder test than the, the real materials. So he also designed a kind of conventional algorithm that he spent many years developing. It's very good. It's kind of probably the state of the art. Uh, so this, this is his result for uh, what he calls pi 4D stem. It's a correlation strain mapping method. This is our results. They're pretty similar. There's some peak splitting here that's not real, uh, but not so, so bad. But again, it gets interesting when you start adding noise. So you had a little bit of Poisson noise, which is a realistic case 
for this electron mi microscope experiment, you can see his peaks broaden a lot more. The splitting becomes more significant. Uh, these are that that's error that is hard to to determine and extract. And then if you can keep pushing this, you can see this is sixty percent of the of the raw signal is just noise, and you're still getting pretty good determination of the strain values here, where uh, the the original information in the kind of the conventional algorithms lost. And this was uh, how he, we, we made him do it to make sure we weren't uh, messing with the tweaking of the hyperparameters in ways that wasn't correct for his fitting process. Uh, so we did this kind of a very systematic study and across the board at all different noise levels, uh, the neural network performed uh, significantly better than the conventional algorithm. So then the question is always like, does it work on real systems? Uh, and so uh, we worked with David Muller at Cornell and Yimo Han at Rice. Uh, they gave us this, this data set of tungsten selenide 2D material. And you're kind of what, what's interesting in this material is there's little strain bands. Uh, unfortunately, this projector makes it even worse that so you can barely see these strain bands here. Uh, but I'll show you kind of our results. So when you look at our results, and you, particularly the histogram, you see these individual peaks. Those, they were never able to see those individual peaks, which have important information about the quantum properties of this material. You can also see that there's much better detail in the, in the, in the underlying image from the strain, strain values. Like this is really nice result of powerful technique. You can zoom in a little more and you can see it's like really crisp uh, Im image resolution that you're getting these, these, you're able to see these strain bands and understand the material in ways not possible. Uh, so uh, we we then took this model, and I had a really good undergraduate student at, at Lehigh who took that model, took just the encoder part, uh, deployed it on an FPGA. We used barely any of the resources on the FPGA. We, were, we, we distilled the model. So what we did is we trained a, a child model on the input-output pairs from our model. Um, you lose some of the quality. In the quantized model, you can see that it's not as crisp, uh, but we're hitting latencies on the order of 29 microseconds for each diffraction image analyzing it on hardware. Uh, so this is really useful. Usually this would take many hours and a person to tweak numbers uh, to get the results. So that means that you don't know what the right imaging conditions are when you're on the microscope. Um, and then having, if we could tie this into metadata, it would be really valuable as well. So I'll talk about one other kind of general, more generalized example. So we've uh, done some recent work uh, with people out of Columbia on uh, controlling tokamak devices with imaging systems. So these are fusion devices used to, for uh, generating uh, energy. So what we did is we kind of took this system and we, this system is really nice because it's highly generalizable. And we're, gonna, we're building a tutorial that should be out pretty soon that kind of goes over this whole workflow of, of taking a high-speed camera built on phantom vision cameras, so up to like 10,000 frames per second, um, passing it to a frame grabber. And if you, the normal process is you pass it to a frame grabber, it takes this parallel data stream, stitches it together to create an image, has, saves it to RAM, and then sends that, RAM, that data off from RAM and onto, onto some usually high-speed flash to keep up with the, the storage. If you wanted to do real-time analysis, you would need to do a PCIe hop to your GPU device, even over G GPU direct. GPUs, you're kind of looking on the order of one millisecond for inference at best in a, in a streaming mode. Um, and that just is not fast enough to hit that 10,000 10, frames per second that we're targeting, uh, particularly if you wanna use it for control applications where you wanna stabilize dynamic phenomena. So, the way that we did is kind of uh, similar. So we took this frame grabber and this frame grabber is from a company called Eurasis. And the nice thing about them is they allow you to, to have an IP block for this coax express uh, protocol, which is what the camera sends data in, and then allow you to, to, to use the rest of the resources on this small FPGA to deploy your own custom logic. Uh, so we have a, a small CNN that's able to analyze convolutional neural network that's able to analyze this data and provide real-time control with latencies on the order of 20 microseconds. Um, so this allows you to control dynamic processes based on imaging. Uh, so we have this tutorial that's gonna be out probably in the next few weeks, hopefully. We'll see, it always takes longer than you expect. Uh, we'll have 
uh, it has a little MNIST example where you can go through the whole pipeline of training the compressed model, compiling it, deploying it on, on this FPGA frame grabber. Because uh, it's a really uni universal platform that allows you to take a Im high-speed imaging system and deploy a neural network for real-time analysis. So now can I can talk about some future directions and things that we're doing here, here at Drexel. So um, we recently, as, as Jane mentioned, got a new uh, grant for a new cluster that we're building. Uh, cluster has some kind of unique, unique features and aspects, uh, really fast flash parallel file system, um, probably built on Weka. We don't know exactly yet. And then a more economical Par parallel file system that's used as a data fed repository that allows you to, to send and share and search data. Um, and the big innovation is that we're, we're really working a lot with end users to try to integrate their instruments directly into this system uh, so that when they're collecting data on their instrument, that it immediately goes to the, to the data fed repository without them using it. And then they have their search tools and share, sharing capabilities and also preserved and backed up. Because backed up. right now, most scientific data is not backed up. It lives in one place. Um, uh, alongside this, we're also gonna have a lot of new compute resources for AI, um, some uh, H200 GPU nodes, as well as some Grace Hopper systems um, and some other A1, A100 nodes as well, all really seamlessly integrated. Um, this is gonna be integrated into a Kubernetes cluster for high availability services. Uh, so you can deploy, deploy and orchestrate different AI services. Uh, another kind of example of things we're working on is doing real-time control in, in PLD. I think this is, this is called pulse laser deposition. So this is the synthesis stuff where I came back from and I put this little video in. I think it's kind of nice. So we have this camera that images, this is 10 million frames per second. It's a short pulse, uh, but that's a plasma dynamics. We're really trying to understand plasma dynamics in, in real time. And so we have if you think about the amount of data and metadata for each of these individual systems, creating a system that can merge all of that, all the multiple sources and all these systems are pretty custom into one unified platform and to make the data searchable and shareable and then save data from this reflection high energy electron diffraction, from the plume dynamics imaging, from the laser profiling, merge them all together and collect all that metadata is a really big infrastructure task and in how you develop that. Um, this is kind of the, the synergy example to that plasma. So this is an example where we're, we are doing ultra fast reflection, high energy electron diffraction. So this measures individual monolayers of growth. Each of these individual peaks is one layer, one atomic layer. Uh, and usually people image this at 30 Hertz, analyze the data later, or they do real time analysis. The real time analysis is to take a convolution kernel. It's a mean kernel, take the average, and then they get a nice plot. That's real-time analysis. Um, what, we, what we did is we increased the speed. This is about 500 hertz. And what you see is that every pulse comes in, you get to see these decay curves. And that's actually the surface diffusion, something that was never seen before. Uh, we can see some interesting things about the surface termination because we're able to see the kinetics of the surface diffusion. Uh, but a single growth is on the order of, I think, 100 gigabytes. So you can think about doing that. Um, it's pretty, pretty crazy. So this is kind of our infrastructure and the, the platform that we're, we're building with FPGAs to analyze some of the high speed data. And then we have integrated control systems and a kind of backplane with a, a physics informed neural network to do stabilization. It's one of the things that we're working on to try to control the manufacturing process in real time. Um, it's a pretty, pretty big infrastructure design task and we're, we're, we have bits and pieces of it developed and it's kind of something that we're really kind of excited about. Um, the last kind of application that we're really working on is some, you know, doing with collaborators at Northwestern and Minnesota is trying to change how electron microscopy is done. Uh, so in electron microscopy, one of the challenges you have to, you have to give the material energy to measure something, but that energy damages the material. Particularly if you're looking at quantum phenomena, you look at like you wanna measure quantum correlations and you wanna stop decoherence, that this energy can break structures that it can actually move atoms as well, completely change structure. Uh, so when you're an experimentalist, you just go in there and you turn knobs and say, oh, this looks good. And then you say, I fixed my condition. That's not good. Um, so 
recently there's been some, some work on like using this electrostatic dose modulator that can control the dose that you apply at, at microsecond level frequencies. And uh, there's been even tools that sit there and will say, okay, we'll count the number of electrons that we see and then stop when we hit a certain amount. That allows you to do dose controlled imaging. But there's no way to do it on do this on pixelated detectors, which is like kind of where we're where like that 4D stem technique is going, where every pixel is a is an image itself. Uh, so we're working on building an infrastructure that takes the data directly from these electron detectors, passes it off to an FPGA, does the real-time analysis to say, do you have a sufficient signal to noise? And then controls this electrostatic dose modulator to control your dosage in real time. And we're 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 getting close to that. Um, 10 kilohertz frequency that we that we want to have. Uh, this is really important because like electron microscopy, you've probably heard of the cryo EM space. That's the main the main reason why they use why they have to go to cryo is because they need to prevent the material from changing its structure. The other way is you control your dose that you apply to your material, and then you don't need to go to cryo EM. Cryo has problems because when you freeze water, uh, even if you freeze it fast, it still expands. It alters structures. Uh, so this is really valuable. So with that, I kind of think it covered a lot. I'd like to acknowledge some of the people who did a, did most of the work. So my uh, two students, uh, Ye Chen and Xu Yu, did a lot of the work on like the uh, symmetry and cycle consistent autoencoder. The student Ali Bak did a lot of work on that physics informed. He was an undergrad neural network. The st student Tree is now at uh, Stanford doing a PhD. Did a lot of the early work on uh, the symmetry structure and that recursive image similarity search. And the student Ryan did a lot, who's going to Northwestern soon, did a lot of work on um, deploying models on FPGAs and just kind of building that tutorial. So hopefully I can share that tutorial really soon. I think it's really fun and exciting. So with that, thank you all for your attention. It's really great to have this many people here and uh, happy to take any questions. Okay, so you can raise your hand in the Zoom and, and uh, Jane will monitor or we can ask questions here. Jane, do you want to deal with the question in ministry? Uh, yeah. I'll, I'll, you keep it and I'll scream because you the, the okay. and then can can we kind of just pick up? I think because we want to make sure we make it. Yeah, I can try to repeat it. Uh, I was wondering how your model can be like adapted to this kind of thing. You mostly talk about image stuff, but there are a lot of parts that are made about the works. Do you have any like? So we've started to do that with different modalities. It's it's very hard because at some point you need to combine them. Um, what we do, which maybe is different because it's our models, we, we have a lot of physics involved, is that we try to really constrain it to the physics so it's interpretable. Um, I think it gets much harder to interpret when you start adding multimodalities. Uh, we, I mean, there, there are definitely ways to do data fusion. Um, and we've Thought about thought about that, and we're thinking like one thing we're interested in playing around with is adding like quantitative information to large language models um, because they're very uh, not so good at doing quantitative things, and that matters a lot for doing things like neural architecture search, especially with like making fast machine learning models. Um, we've played with different modalities where you have spectra and images together. Um, in our cases, a lot of times we have an extra dimension that we don't analyze. And that allows us to do validation, and that can help. Um, but it's data fusion's hard. I don't think there's a good answer to that. So it was about the the question was about complexities of of user interface and I guess user compliance. Um, so 
I think it's really just that a lot of the researchers that are doing experiments, they're very focused on their physical experiment, not their data management. They just care about getting the results today. So if you make them do any extra step, sometimes they're not very computationally aware. So they have minimal, like somewhat marginal computational literacy. So if you have them have them do a command line call, like that's not going to happen. Um, they don't like the value for doing data aggregation and collation um, is something that happens far downstream. So they don't see immediate value. Uh, so there's a chicken and egg problem. Like who, like wh how do you get them? To, so the only way that you can really get people to do it is to make it trans, like completely transparent to them. It just has to be part of their, their natural workflow. And then they can slowly see the added value as, as at least my perspective. Um, if you if you hide it underneath and just have it happen, then they're going to comply because they don't have a choice. And they can still keep moving around data on their USB sticks and passing viruses from instrument to instrument. Um, How can metadata facilitate your discovery? So that's an interesting question. I don't know if we know exactly how it is, but but in terms of like having metadata to discover similar like growth conditions or process conditions that we have and be able to look back through time and did someone do a similar study? Is there some reference point that I could use to guide my initial steps and to guide as I make an observation what are the similar things that I've that have been done in the past beyond just my current memory and knowledge? Because when you do the a lot of times you'll you'll maybe do a hundred growths uh, probably in your PhD a PhD person might do like during your PhD five hundred growths, and your memory is very limited to the short period of like maybe the last ten that you've done, and so your ability your ability to correlate back in time and and make better decisions is going to be dependent on can you can you limit your your data repository based on metadata or can you search even other research groups metadata and find similar similar experiments that have been done so you don't repeat because each of these experiments is probably a thousand dollars so that's can i jump in on the metadata question for a second? yeah yeah i mean it comes it comes down to return on investment these experiments are are really costly time like human resources, labor resources. And, you know, the same experiments are done, right, repeatedly. So, I mean, the metadata standards still exist for this stuff yet. I mean, I, I like to think about a public school, you know, a public school is basically metadata of the experience. But there's just no way to save all this data. Yeah. It's just not practical. And Jane might get mad at me for saying this but i've been in a lot of conversations where they're like oh let's build a schema for this and it's just a bunch of bickering back and forth and so like really you just have to start with something it doesn't have to be perfect to start we can put band-aids on it later if it's not perfect but we need to have some data right now like right now we have no metadata and no data preserved <laughs> Katie, you have a question. Yeah. yeah. So I guess um, looking at all these different um, these different problems you're you're, you're working on using this technique and like all the different domain fields in it. I guess the question I have is how do you actually and you kind of kind of hinted at the answer you haven't I think you might have not done yet. How do you actually get the metadata for all these different types of fields, considering the fact that there's all these different domains with all these different metrics with all these different things you need to be aware of? Can you do it through domain experts working with you, or is there something else that's uh, so, so capture data during the experiment, but yeah. So I mean, there's a, that's a very hard problem. I think you you need to build a platform that's simple enough that experts can do it, and then build also have and part of this MRI grant, we're going to have a a staff person who's who recently accepted who's going to uh, come and and help facilitate that because you need a liaison between the end user and the, the, the implementation system. Uh, there's, there's a lot of people problems in doing this. The, the psychology of how to get people to actually uh, participate in these sort of things is, is challenging. There's also a challenge with the actual uh, implementation of it. 
because on the one hand, if you make it so freeform that anyone can make, you know, add their own metadata and load into this thing, there's a possibility it becomes not very helpful because that individual might not be doing a very good job with the metadata. But if you also make it too strict, how would you get that to capture everything? Yeah, I, I think that's a, a good point and probably something that your field cares about more than our, our field. Like, we have to, like, put in perspective that if it's, I think it needs to be very loose because if it's strict and people don't, if people see one thing they don't like, they're going to not use it. So it's better to have compliance with imperfect metadata and then maybe use tools like things that Jane builds, like Hive, or uh, using more kind of new techniques with large language models to draw correlations that can deal with the imperfection in the schemas that is going to exist. Okay. Just give 30 seconds for people online. Thank yeah, you. people online. Mm -hmm. While they're doing that, can you just go back one slide? Which? This one? This one. Yeah, so this I'm particularly fond of because of the generalizability of a platform that's just a CCD camera connected to a, a frame grabber at high speed with a convolutional neural network, and you can just drop in whatever block you want and adapt it to your application. And so you have a turnkey way to do fast analysis of images. In your experiment, when you are doing, you're using the CNN and you're uh, providing certain attributes, how do you collect and save those so that you can uh, reflect later? So, I mean, we, we, we definitely save the, we save the raw data and save the results and save the, uh, the metadata associated with that experiment. They're kind of disaggregated. Um, building that infrastructure is hard. Does that help, can that help you before discovery? You, you said you were looking forward at how comparing, comparing what it was before with after what your expectation was, what it was, but how about the metadata associated with what created those differences? Well, I mean, that's like, we're definitely building that in in our training pipelines as well. Cause like there's there's the side of, oh, let's do the experiments. But there's also the side of like, what is the metadata associated with the training process? Okay. Yeah. Uh, that we're, I mean, there's a lot of tools out there that help with logging and monitoring training. Uh, the, and we're, we're definitely in a, integrating some. There's always a, a decision like it creates a massive amount of data. Right, but it, the thing it, taking care of the real hard stuff that is mysterious to a lot of people. Um, that data is significant to me. Is, the, it worthy, is it worthy of, of even looking at it again? It seems like a lot of people just throw the data out there. It's there, it, it's there as an aftermath of the, of the experiment, but it's never. I mean, to, to have like have some level of checkpointing in your training process and uh, specifically provenance of like what data was used in the training process. Yeah. And seeds, for instance, for reproducible machine learning training and hardware hardware implementations matter because like you are on different architectures of GPUs, for instance, your training is completely different. There's no way to have reproducibility. Yeah. And some of that is is saved. Um, we can stick around and see if people have yeah. some questions. I think we can here for a few minutes. Yes. But I do know that some people might have other things to go and get people on the meeting call too. So we need to leave the break and stand on so we don't have time for a few minutes. Okay. So okay. let's thank Josh again. Yeah, thanks. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. I'm in the NCI department, yeah. and uh, one of the things that I really saw was the, the data fed system that you guys have to bring. Um, I don't know, I don't know the details of it. Uh, I'm just doing this for the first time. I'm really sure, but I'm also a little excited about it. Is there any more potential opportunities that you guys might work on? Yeah, there, def there definitely is. Um, let me just say something.
Turn off the microphone.